chapter nine of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b good stories for great birthdays by francis jenkins alcott january eleventh alexander hamilton defender of the constitution the constitution or the new roof seventeen eighty seven our roof is now raised and our song still shall be a federal head or a people that's free huzza my brave boys our work is complete the world shall admire columbia's fair seat its strength against tempest and time shall be proof and thousands shall come to dwell under our roof francis hopkinson condensed alexander hamilton he gave the whole powers of his mind to the contemplation of the weak and distracted condition of the country he saw the absolute necessity of some closer bond of union for the states he saw at last his hopes fulfilled he saw the constitution adopted and the government under it established and organized the discerning eye of washington immediately called him to the post which was far the most important in the administration of the new system he was made secretary of the treasury and how he fulfilled the duties of such a place at such a time the whole country perceived with delight and the whole world saw with admiration daniel webster alexander hamilton was born in the west indies january eleventh seventeen fifty seven came to new york city seventeen seventy two signed the constitution seventeen eighty seven was appointed first secretary of the treasury seventeen eighty nine he was killed by aaron burr in a duel eighteen hundred four the boy of the hurricane on the eleventh of january seventeen fifty seven there was born on the little west indian island of nevis a boy who was to become one of the foremost citizens of his adopted country and who was to have a large part in determining its independence its form of government and in working out the details of its administration this was alexander hamilton his mother died when he was very young his father was not so situated as properly to care for his son so he was sent to the adjoining island of st croix to live with his mother's relatives who were people of means he was given a place in their counting-house where he acquitted himself with much credit though the work was not at all to his liking when hamilton was only fifteen years old a terrible hurricane swept over the island the sea was lashed into fury the storm swept across the land uprooting trees and carrying devastation in its path even the bravest of the inhabitants were greatly frightened and many were terror-stricken but young hamilton watched the storm with the greatest interest and without fear a few days later an account of the storm appeared in a paper printed in a neighboring island the account was so vivid the word painting so marvelous that the people were certain some writer of note must have been among them without their knowledge and when they learned that the account was written by alexander hamilton and he a mere boy they were greatly astonished they felt that such a lad should have a better chance for education than st croix could afford and a wider field in which to exercise his talents his friends raised a fund for him and he was sent to america he entered a preparatory school at elizabethtown in the jerseys he then went to new york city and entered king's college now columbia university at this time he was disposed to side with the friends of the king of england in the controversy between the colonists and the mother country but after he had been at college for half a year he made a visit to boston where he heard samuel adams james otis and other patriots and came back a most earnest patriot himself about the time of the breaking out of the war for independence hamilton organized a company of the college students who adopted the name hearts of oak later hamilton was appointed the captain of the first company of artillery raised in the colony he so thoroughly drilled and disciplined it that the attention of general green was attracted he sought the acquaintance of hamilton and spoke most enthusiastically to washington about him saying that he was a natural master of men and a young man worthy 
the attention of the commander-in-chief sherman williams arranged call colonel hamilton while young hamilton was directing his battery during the passage of the raritan washington who was anxiously watching the passing of the troops observed hamilton's skill and courage he ordered one of his officers to find out the young man's name and tell him to report at headquarters therefore as soon as possible young hamilton hurried to headquarters as a result of this interview washington made him a member of his own staff hamilton became washington's private secretary many a night after long hours of work together washington and hamilton would retire to their rooms then suddenly a courier with important dispatches would gallop up to headquarters washington would arise read the dispatches and say call colonel hamilton and the young secretary would come and take his dictation washington had the greatest confidence in hamilton's judgment so much did washington value his advice that when he wrote his farewell address acting as every wise man would do under the circumstances he asked hamilton for his opinion as he also asked james madison for his washington desired to get the different points of view of two large minds on so important a document a struggle after the constitution of the united states had been framed by the constitutional convention a severe political struggle took place to bring about its ratification by the states themselves there were selfish political interests at work to prevent ratification the influence of alexander hamilton through his speeches and writings so brilliant and convincing did much to bring the people of the united states to understand the absolute necessity for a strong federal union and for a constitution to safeguard the liberties of the country in the state of new york the opposition to ratification was most violent but alexander hamilton during weeks of furious debate in the state convention spoke again and again in defense of the constitution and when the weary weeks of contention were past the vote was taken and alexander hamilton's arguments had won votes enough to carry the ratification of the constitution he had saved the day he knows everything he knows everything said robert morris to president washington robert morris during the war for independence had been superintendent of finance when congress needed funds when washington wished money with which to pay the soldiers robert morris provided the means since his private commercial credit was great men had confidence in his business ability and honor once when congress was utterly without cash robert morris supplied the army with four or five thousand barrels of flour and when france sent troops to america to fight for us robert morris personally borrowed through count rochambeau money for our country's use when robert morris sought to procure for congress money from abroad he borrowed large sums through the patriot hyam solomon the little friend in front street so after washington was elected president and while he was making up his cabinet he visited robert morris and said the treasury morris will of course be your birth after your invaluable services as financier of the revolution no one can pretend to contest the office of secretary of the treasury with you this flattering offer robert morris promptly declined adding but my dear general you will be no loser by my declining the secretaryship of the treasury for i can recommend to you a far cleverer fellow than i am for your minister of finance in the person of your former aide-de-camp colonel hamilton i always knew colonel hamilton to be a man of superior talents said washington but never supposed he had any knowledge of finance to which robert morris replied he knows everything sir to a mind like his nothing comes amiss washington then appointed hamilton to be secretary of the treasury hamilton took up his duties the country and the states were in debt he organized the finances of our young and new nation putting them upon a sound basis he provided funds with which to pay the national debt so that the united states of america might command the respect of the nations of the world it was alexander hamilton who laid the foundations of the financial system of our republic end of chapter nine
Chapter Ten of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Section Ten, January Seventeenth, Benjamin Franklin, the American Socrates we have reason to be thankful he was so long spared that the most useful life should be the longest also that it was protracted so far beyond the ordinary span allotted to man as to avail us of his wisdom in the establishment of our own freedom thomas jefferson our country dr benjamin franklin to general george washington i must soon quit the scene but you may live to see our country flourish as it will amazingly and rapidly after the war is over like a field of young indian corn which long fair weather and sunshine had enfeebled and discoloured and which in that weak state by a thunder gust of violent wind hail and rain seemed to be threatened with absolute destruction yet the storm being past it recovers fresh verdure shoots up with double vigour and delights the eye not of its owner only but of every observing traveller march fifth seventeen eighty benjamin franklin was born in boston january seventeenth seventeen hundred six went to philadelphia seventeen twenty three through his diplomacy france was persuaded to recognize the united states by treaty february sixth seventeen seventy eight he signed the constitution of the united states seventeen eighty seven he died in philadelphia april seventeenth seventeen ninety the whistle told by franklin himself when i was a child of seven years old my friends on a holiday filled my pocket with coppers i went directly to a shop where they sold toys for children and being charmed with the sound of a whistle that i met by the way in the hands of another boy i voluntarily offered and gave all my money for one i then came home and went whistling all over the house much pleased with my whistle but disturbing all the family my brothers and sisters and cousins understanding the bargain i had made told me i had given four times as much for it as it was worth put me in mind what good things i might have bought with the rest of the money and laughed at me so much for my folly that i cried with vexation and the reflection gave me more chagrin than the whistle gave me pleasure this however was afterwards of use to me the impression continuing on my mind so that often when i was tempted to buy some unnecessary thing i said to myself don't give too much for the whistle and i saved my money as i grew up came into the world and observed the actions of men i thought i met with many very many who gave too much for the whistle from the whistle the candle maker's boy benjamin franklin when a boy used to work in his father's shop at the sign of the blue ball his father was a tallow chandler and made soap and candles the boy got up early cut wicks for candles filled moulds with tallow ran errands and tended shop though he worked hard and honestly his heart was not in his work he wanted to go to sea his elder brother a sailor had come home and he told the most thrilling tales of his adventures so benjamin franklin could not get the sea out of his mind he grew to detest the trade of tallow chandler and hankered more and more for the sea his father wishing him to give up thoughts of a roving life took him to talk with joiners bricklayers turners and other workmen and to watch them at work but none of their trades appealed to the boy his place was at home his father urged adding seest thou a man diligent in his calling he shall stand before kings he shall not stand before mean men the boy of the printing press but benjamin franklin did not run away to sea he became a printer's boy because he liked books he was apprenticed to his brother james who had set up a printing press in boston to james's house he went taking with him his collection of precious volumes there he worked hard by day and read and studied at night recollecting his father's favorite proverb seest thou a man diligent in his calling he shall stand before kings franklin saved his money 
and worked early and late when james began to issue a newspaper franklin helped him print it and delivered copies to customers he wrote articles and slipped them under the printing-house door and james published them without knowing who was their author later franklin wrote clever audacious and humorous articles on the questions of the day which were widely read and much talked about so things continued until he was seventeen years old when he ran away but not to sea he and his brother quarrelled often benjamin the apprentice was saucy and provoking and james the master was hot-tempered and beat his younger brother severely after a particularly bad quarrel franklin sold some of his books and took passage on a sloop bound for new york arriving at new york he found no employment there and went on to philadelphia the three rolls early in the morning of an october day young benjamin franklin seventeen years old and seeking his fortune reached philadelphia he was tired and hungry and had only a dollar of his little fun left he stopped at a baker's and bought three big puffy rolls he put a roll under each arm and munching the third walked along market street in the doorway of a house stood a young girl she saw the awkward handsome boy trudging past hungrily eating a big roll she laughed to herself she thought it funny to see him with his broad-brimmed hat knee-breeches and buckled shoes all shabby and dusty and his great pockets stuffed with stockings and shirts so she laughed to herself did deborah reed and little she knew that in a few years she would become that boy's wife but so it happened young benjamin franklin found work in a printer's shop he came to lodge at deborah reed's home in a few years he owned his own printing press he married deborah reed he became a well-known printer he issued an influential newspaper and published poor richard's almanac he was industrious studious thrifty and prosperous in time he became the most famous and learned citizen of pennsylvania and a great american patriot standing before kings when the american colonies rose against the exactions of england benjamin franklin was called upon to serve his country as a diplomat in france and england my father wrote franklin having among his instructions to me when a boy frequently repeated a proverb of solomon seest thou a man diligent in his calling he shall stand before kings he shall not stand before mean men i from thence considered industry as a means of obtaining wealth and distinction which encouraged me though i did not think that i should ever literally stand before kings which however has since happened for i have stood before five and even had the honour of sitting down with one the king of denmark to dinner the wonderful kite experiment in benjamin franklin's time there were no electric trains no telegraphs telephones radiographs and radiophones the driving and lighting power of electricity was not understood people did not know that lightning was due to the presence of electricity in nature benjamin franklin who was keen and inquisitive made scientific experiments with the leyden jar and with simple machines which produced electricity by friction he discovered that in certain ways the action of electricity and lightning was the same and he observed that electric fluid might be conducted along a pack string so he determined to prove that electricity and lightning were the same by drawing lightning down from the clouds along a pack string he used a silk kite with a sharp pointed wire fastened to its framework and a silk ribbon tied to the end of the kite string holding a metal key in place he secretly flew the kite during a june thunderstorm and as he saw the kite string stiffen in a strange way he eagerly laid his hand against the key instantly he felt a shock of electricity pass through him he had made one of the most important discoveries of all ages his discovery was soon known throughout the world men made other experiments and in time invented the wonderful electrical machines and devices which we enjoy today the rising sun when the federal constitutional convention met at philadelphia general washington was unanimously made president of the convention he took the chair with diffidence he assured the members that he was not used to such a situation 
that he was embarrassed and he hoped that they would excuse his errors and in what masterly fashion he conducted the convention history shows behind his chair was painted a picture of the sun after the debates were over and the constitution was adopted benjamin franklin who had just signed the immortal document turned to some of the members he drew their attention to the sun behind general washington's chair i have often and often said franklin in the course of the session and the vicissitudes of my hopes and fears as to its issue looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting but now at length i have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun to my friend from franklin's will and testament my fine crabtree walking stick with a gold head curiously wrought in the form of the cap of liberty i give to my friend and the friend of mankind general washington if it were a sceptre he has merited it and would become it benjamin franklin end of chapter ten chapter eleven of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org good stories for great birthdays by francis jenkins alcott february twelfth abraham lincoln the great emancipator with malice toward none with charity for all with firmness in the right as god gives us to see the right let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations abraham lincoln march fourth eighteen sixty five oh slow to smite and swift to spare gentle and merciful and just who in the fear of god didst bear the sword of power a nation's trust in sorrow by thy bier we stand amid the awe that hushes all and speak the anguish of a land that shook with horror at thy fall thy task is done the bond are free we bear thee to an honoured grave whose proudest monument shall be the broken fetters of the slave pure was thy life its bloody close hath placed thee with the sons of light among the noble host of those who perished in the cause of right william cullen bryant abraham lincoln was born february twelfth eighteen o nine was elected president eighteen sixty issued the emancipation proclamation new year's day eighteen sixty three was re-elected eighteen sixty four he was assassinated eighteen sixty five the cabin in the clearing it was only a small cabin in a forest clearing in the wilderness of indiana it stood on a knoll overlooking a piece of ground where corn and vegetables grew in the woods around the cabin were bear deer and other wild creatures the furniture was rude brought from the east or made of logs and hickory sticks while the bed was a sack of leaves in the big fireplace the logs cut from the forest burned with a cheerful blaze and there lived little abe lincoln nine years old with his father and sister and his mother nancy hanks lincoln abe was born in kentucky when he was seven his family moved to the cabin in indiana he helped clear the way through the wilderness to the new home so with swinging the axe and blazing trails he was made unusually large and strong for his age alert and courageous a real backwoods boy he could shoot fish cut down trees and work on the farm in the clearing in his veins ran the red blood of kentucky pioneers his grandfather in the days of daniel boone had been killed by an indian while abe's father a child then had been rescued from the same indian by his brother mordecai lincoln a daring lad who shot the savage with his dead father's rifle so saving his little brother how he learned to be just let us have faith that right makes might and in that faith let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it 
abraham lincoln from his speech at cooper institute but it was not all work for abe on the new farm in indiana he picked wild plums and pawpaws in the woods and ate corn dodgers fried bacon roast wild turkey and fish caught in the indiana streams he went to school when he could which was not often for in those days schools were few and far between and teachers were not many but little abe had the best teacher of all his mother nancy lincoln for though his father could scarcely write his own name his mother could read and she loved books she taught her little son his letters and how to read often they sat together in the cabin abe and his sister at their mother's knee while she read the bible to them i would rather my son would be able to read the bible than to own a farm if he can't have but one she said she was a beautiful woman slender sad and pale with dark hair she was more refined than most women of those hardy pioneer times but she could use a rifle work on the farm spin and do other housework because of her gentle and firm character she was loved and respected not only by her husband and children but by her neighbors above all things she had a deep and tender religious spirit which she shared with abe and his sister sarah she taught abe to love truth and justice and to revere god in time he could repeat by heart much of the bible and when he grew up he thought and wrote in the simple clear and forceful language of the bible and he learned from it his ideas of right and his scorn of wrong making him honest abe off to new orleans young abe lincoln went on several flatboat trips carrying produce down the mississippi to new orleans one of these trips made a deep and lasting impression upon him in new orleans he visited the slave market there negro men women and children were bought sold and flogged wives were torn from their husbands children from their mothers and auctioned off like cattle the anguish of these scenes wrung lincoln's heartstrings with quivering lips he said if ever i get a chance to hit that thing i will hit it hard john hanks a relative who was with him at the slave market said in after years lincoln saw it his heart bled said nothing much was silent looked bad i can say it knowing him that it was on this trip that he formed his opinions of slavery it runs into iron into him then and there the kindness of lincoln the little birds when lincoln was a lawyer one day he was going with a party of lawyers to attend court they were riding two by two on horseback through a country lane lincoln in the rear as they passed through a thicket of wild plum and crab-apple trees his friends missed him where is he they asked just then lincoln's companion came riding up oh replied he when i saw him last he had caught two young birds that the wind had blown out of their nest and was hunting for the nest to put them back after a little while lincoln rode up and when his friends rallied him about his tender heart he said i could not have slept unless i had restored those little birds to their mother rescuing the pig another time lincoln was riding past a deep miry ditch and saw a pig struggling in the mud the animal could not get out and was squealing with terror lincoln looked at the pig and the mud and then at his clothes clean ones that he had just put on then he decided in favor of the clean clothes and rode along but he could not get rid of the thought of the poor animal struggling so pitifully in its terror he had not gone far when he turned back he reached the ditch dismounted and tied his horse then he collected some old wooden rails and with them made a footbridge to the bottom of the ditch he carefully walked down the bridge and caught hold of the pig he pulled it out and setting it on the ground let it run away the screaming struggling pig had spattered lincoln's clean clothes with mud his hands were covered with filth so he went to the nearest brook washed them and wiped them on the grass later when telling a friend about his adventure lincoln said that he had rescued the pig for purely selfish reasons to take a pain out of his own mind opening their eyes it was toward the close of the civil war the crisis had come and the end of the long struggle was in sight the union troops were hemming in richmond president lincoln went himself to city point and there he remained anxiously waiting in his tent lived a pet cat it had a family of newborn kittens sometimes the president relieved his mind by playing with them 
finally richmond was taken and lincoln prepared to visit the city before he left his tent he picked up one of the kittens saying little kitten i must perform a last act of kindness for you before i go i must open your eyes he passed his hand gently over its closed lids until the eyes opened then he set the kitten on the floor and said oh that i could open the eyes of my blinded fellow countrymen as easily as i have those of that little creature lincoln and the children hurrah for lincoln abraham lincoln loved children and even strange children were drawn to him as though they had known him all their lives here are a few of the stories told about lincoln and his child friends soon after lincoln was elected president he went to chicago where he was welcomed with shouts and cheers later as he sat in a room talking with friends a little boy was let in at the sight of the president-elect he took off his hat and swung it shouting hurrah for lincoln lincoln rose and catching the little fellow in his strong hands tossed him to the ceiling shouting hurrah for you only eight of us sir on the same visit to chicago while lincoln was talking with visitors a little german girl heading a delegation of other girls walked timidly up to him what do you want my little girl what can i do for you he asked kindly i want your name she said but there are many other little girls that want my name and as i cannot give it to them all they will feel hurt if i give it to you she looked around at her companions and said only eight of us sir lincoln could not resist that so he sat down immediately and forgetting his other visitors took eight sheets of paper and wrote a line and his name on each these he gave to the little girls and they went away happy he's beautiful once a little girl's father took her to call upon lincoln she had been told that he was very homely but when he lifted her on his knee and talked to her in his kindly merry way she turned to her father and exclaimed oh pa he isn't ugly at all he's beautiful please let your beard grow but there was another little girl who did not think so she lived in westfield in the state of new york she had seen lincoln's picture and did not like it so after his election she wrote a letter asking him to let his beard grow as she thought it would make him better looking lincoln enjoyed the letter very much it happened later that he was on a train passing through westfield and as the train stopped for a few minutes he was asked to address the people at the station he told about the letter and stroking his chin added i intend to follow her advice he then called for the little girl she came forward and he greeted her kindly three little girls one day after lincoln had gone to washington three little girls the children of a working man went to the white house on a reception day they joined the throng and were pushed along until they came to where lincoln was shaking hands with each of his visitors when the children reached him they were so bashful that they did not dare to put out their hands but lincoln saw them passing by and called little girls are you going to pass me without shaking hands then stooping over he kept every one waiting while he shook hands with each child the president and the bible lincoln's love of truth justice and mercy his detestation of everything ignoble brutal or mean were taught him or strengthened in him from childhood through his reading of the bible the language of his speeches and writings was forceful and direct like the english of the bible and such a phrase as a house divided against itself he took from the bible while president he used to carry a new testament with him and he could quote whole passages he used often to rise early in the morning to get time to read and pray before the pressing business of the day began he read the bible aloud to the colored servants of the white house once when a committee of colored people waited upon him to present him with a fine copy of the bible he took it and made a speech to them a part of which was in regard to this great book i have but to say it is the best gift god has given to man all the good saviour gave to the world was communicated through this book but for it we could not know right from wrong all things most desirable for man's welfare here and hereafter are to be found portrayed in it to you i return my most sincere thanks for the very elegant copy of the great book of god which you present washington and lincoln speak a lincoln order to the army and navy the president commander-in-chief of the army and navy 
desires and enjoins the orderly observance of the sabbath by the officers and men in the military and naval service the importance for man and beast of the prescribed weekly rest the sacred rights of christian soldiers and sailors a becoming deference to the best sentiment of a christian people and a due regard for the divine will demand that sunday labor in the army and navy be reduced to the measure of strict necessity the discipline and character of the national forces should not suffer nor the cause they defend be imperiled by the profanation of the day or name of the most high at this time of public distress adopting the words of washington in seventeen seventy six men may find enough to do in the service of god and their country without abandoning themselves to vice and immorality the first general order issued by the father of his country after the declaration of independence indicates the spirit in which our institutions were founded and should ever be defended the general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor to live and act as becomes a christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country november fifteenth eighteen sixty two address delivered at the dedication of the gettysburg national cemetery fourscore and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure we are met on a great battlefield of that war we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this but in a larger sense we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate we cannot hallow this ground the brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract the world will little note nor long remember what we say here but it can never forget what they did here it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under god shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth abraham lincoln november nineteenth eighteen sixty three the following famous stories about lincoln are in good stories for great holidays a solomon come to judgment the colonel of the zouaves courage of his convictions george pickett's friend he rescues the birds his springfield farewell address lincoln and the little girl lincoln the lawyer mr lincoln and the bible a stranger at five points training for the presidency why lincoln was called honest abe the widow and her three sons the young sentinel end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sarah jump good stories for great birthdays by francis jenkins olcott february twenty second george washington the father of his country part one where may the wearied eye repose when gazing on the great where neither guilty glory glows nor despicable state yes one the first the last the best the cincinnatus of the west whom envy dared not hate bequeathed the name of washington to make man blush there was but one lord byron lincoln on washington's birthday this is the one hundred and tenth anniversary of the birthday of Washington. We are met to celebrate this day. Washington is the mightiest name of earth, long since mightiest in the cause of civil liberty, 
still mightiest in moral reformation. On that name no eulogy is expected. It cannot be, to add brightness to the sun or glory to the name of Washington. It is alike impossible. Let none attempt it. Abraham Lincoln, February 22, 1849 Washington was born February 22, 1732 was appointed commander-in-chief of the American Army, 1775, was made president of the Federal Convention for Framing the Constitution and Signed the Constitution, 1787, was inaugurated first president of the United States, 1789, issued his farewell address, 1796. He died at Mount Vernon, December 14, 1799. The Boy in the Valley the boy George Washington was magnificently strong and tall, with firm muscles and powerful body. He could run, leap, wrestle, toss the bar, and pitch quoits. He rode fiery horses and hunted foxes. He was a silent, determined lad, truth-telling with a wonderful grip on his temper. By the time that he was sixteen, he was an excellent surveyor. And he was a proud and happy boy when one spring day he leaped on his horse, and with a companion— rode away into the wilderness on a real job of surveying. Lord Fairfax, his close friend, owned a great estate of over five million acres stretching to the westward. A part of the estate was a wilderness, and lay on the other side of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It had never been surveyed. Squatters were stealing the land, so Lord Fairfax had sent sixteen-year-old George Washington to survey it for him. As the boy rode over the mountains and guided his horse down the steep trail into the beautiful Shenandoah Valley, spring was busy all around him. Cascades and torrents of snow water were rushing from the mountain tops to feed the bright Shenandoah River, the daughter of the stars, the Indians called the river. The boy spent the better part of the first day riding through fine groves of sugar maples and admiring the trees and the richness of the land. Here and there showed the little clearings where the squatters were preparing their small farms for crops of tobacco, hemp, and corn. For some days he surveyed along the banks of the river and in the valley, roughing it at night, and many were the adventures he had, about which he has written in his diary. Sometimes he slept before the campfire, or in a hut, at others in a tent. Once he was nearly burnt to death when his straw bed caught fire. He roasted wild turkeys and ate off chips for plates. He swam his horse through swollen streams and followed the rough roads made by the squatters. But his most exciting adventure was with the Indians. On the bank of the Potomac stood a little cabin. Near it was hung a huge kettle suspended over a place always ready for a fire. The cabin belonged to Cressa, a frontiersman, and so did the kettle. He kept the fireplace and everything in readiness for the passing Indians to cook their meals. The grateful redskins called him Big Spoon. Rain and floods drove Washington to the cabin. Big Spoon invited him to stay until the bad weather was past. On the third day, Washington looked out and saw a band of Indians carrying a scalp come toward the cabin. It was a war party returning from a raid. Big Spoon greeted them heartily, for everybody was welcome at his place, the Indians built a fire, sat down in a circle, and held a big celebration. Then they performed a war dance, while their musicians played on drums made of pots half full of water, with deerskins stretched tightly over them. And as Washington watched their savage antics, he little dreamed how soon he himself would be fighting with redskins. When his surveying was finished, he returned home to make his report. Lord Fairfax was delighted with his careful work, and fine maps. In fact, today, the surveys Washington made when a boy stand unquestioned. They are so perfect. Roughing it in the Shenandoah Valley was not the last of Washington's adventures in the wilderness. He was appointed public surveyor. For the next three years, he spent a great deal of time in the wilds with settlers, frontiersmen, trappers, and Indians. He grew to be over six feet tall and remarkably strong and rugged. He overcame difficulties and faced dangers through pluck and perseverance. He became a colonel of a Virginia regiment. He acquired military training and widened his knowledge of handling all sorts of men. What he learned about Indian warfare and life in the forests 
and in the wilderness taught him the caution and knowledge which he showed while guarding the retreat of what was left of Braddock's troops. So his adventures while a boy in the valley, and his experiences as a young man roughing it on the frontier, fighting with Indians, carrying messages through the wilderness, and serving as a soldier, all prepared Washington to become the liberator of our country. Washington was like his mother in qualities of character. He had her strength of will, love of truth, firm purpose, high sense of duty, dignity, and reverence. All these noble qualities were strengthened and made practical by her careful education and discipline. When he became great, she was quietly proud of him, and when people spoke warmly of his glory and success, she would say, But my good sirs, here is too much flattery. Still, George will not forget the lessons I early taught him. He will not forget himself, though he is the subject of so much praise. When she was informed by special messenger that Cornwallis had surrendered, she exclaimed, Thank God! War will now be ended, and peace, independence, and happiness bless our country. After the surrender of Cornwallis, Washington visited his mother at Fredericksburg, where she was living in her own little house. She was about seventy-five years old. He reached Fredericksburg, surrounded by his numerous and brilliant suite. He dismounted and sent to inquire when it would be her pleasure to receive him. Afoot and alone, he walked to her house. She was by herself, employed in a household task, when she was told that the victor chief was waiting at her door. She bade him welcome by a warm embrace, calling him George, the dear familiar name of his childhood. She spoke to him of old times and old friends, but of his glory not one word. Meanwhile, in the town of Fredericksburg, there was excitement and rejoicing. The place was crowded with foreign and American officers. Gentlemen from miles around were hastening into town to congratulate the conquerors of Yorktown. Citizens got up a splendid ball in Washington's honor, to which his mother was specially invited. The foreign officers were eager to meet their chief's mother. They had heard of her remarkable character. They expected to see her enter the ballroom in glittering attire, clad in rich brocades like the noble ladies of Europe. How surprised they were, when leaning on her son's arm she entered dressed simply. She was dignified and imposing. She received quietly all the compliments and attentions showered upon her. At an early hour she wished the company much pleasure, saying that it was time for old folk to be in bed. She retired, leaning on the arm of her son. "'If such are the matrons in America,' exclaimed the foreign officers, "'well may she boast of illustrious sons.'" George Washington Park Custis and Other Sources Washington's Wedding Day Washington plighted his troth with Martha Dandridge, the charming widow of Daniel Park Custis. She was young, pretty, intelligent, and an heiress. It was a brilliant wedding party which assembled on a winter day in the little church near Mrs. Custis's home. There were gathered the gay, free-thinking, high-living governor, gorgeous in scarlet and gold, British officers red-coated and gold-laced, and all the neighboring gentry in their handsomest clothes. The bride was attired in silk and satin, laces and brocade, with pearls on her neck and in her ears, while the bridegroom appeared in blue and silver trimmed with scarlet and with gold buckles at his knees and on his shoes. After the ceremony, the bride was taken home in a coach and six, Washington riding beside her, mounted on a splendid horse, and followed by all the gentlemen of the party. Henry Cabot Lodge. Arranged. Washington and the Children. 1. There were two joyous little people who went to live with the bride in her new home at Mount Vernon. They were her two children, Jack Custis, six years old, and his sister Patsy, just four years old. Washington gave them little ponies to ride. He bought fashionably dressed baby dolls for Patsy, silver shoe and knee buckles for Jack, and for both of them toys, gingerbread figures, sugar images, and little books with colored pictures in them. He gave them each a Bible, bound in turkey leather with their names printed in gilt letters on the inside covers. 2. Washington loved all children. He always smiled at them. He was specially popular with boys. When he rode in state to Independence Hall in his cream-colored coach drawn by six bays, and with postilions and outriders, boys were always at hand to cheer as he drove by, and when he returned to Mount Vernon there were other boys waiting to welcome him. He could always count on boys wherever he went to shout and wave their hats. 
He used to touch his own hat to them as politely as if they were veterans on parade. After his great dinners at Mount Vernon, as soon as the guests were done eating, he would tell his steward to call in the neighbor's boys, who were never far away at such a time. In they would come, crowding around the table and make quick work of the cakes, nuts, and raisins the guests had left. At twilight, Washington had a habit of pacing up and down the large room on the first floor with his hands behind him. One evening, a boy who had never seen him climbed up to a high open window to look in at him. The boy fell and hurt himself. Washington heard him cry and sent a servant to see what was the matter. The servant came back and said, The boy was trying to get a look at you, sir. Bring him in, said Washington. And when the boy came in, he patted him on the head, saying, You wanted to see General Washington, did you? Well, I am General Washington. But the little fellow shook his head and replied, No, you are only just a man. I want to see the president. Washington laughed and told him that he was the president and a man for all that. Then he had the servant give him some cakes and nuts and sent him away happy. Grace Greenwood and Other Sources Retold The Little Girl and the Redcoats when Washington, with the army, entered Boston after the British had evacuated the city, he made the best tavern in town his headquarters. It had been the British headquarters. The tavern keeper's little girl was running about, very much interested in all that was going on. Washington called her to him, and holding her on his knee, asked, Now that you've seen the soldiers on both sides, which do you like best? The little girl hesitated, but like the great Washington himself, she could not tell a lie, so she said, I like the redcoats best. Washington laughed at her frankness and said gently, Yes, my dear, the redcoats do look the best, but it takes the ragged boys to do the fighting. Wayne Whipple, Retold Nellie and Little Washington George Washington loved children, and, as he had none of his own, he adopted two of his wife's grandchildren, Nellie Custis and George Washington Park Custis. The little boy was known as Washington. Nellie was a beautiful child with smiling black eyes and thick curly brown hair, while her brother was of very light complexion. They had good times together at Mount Vernon. There was a delightfully fearsome pack of hounds in the kennel, French dogs, the gift of Lafayette, fierce, big-mouthed, savage, and there were litters of beautiful puppies. The stables were full of horses, fine creatures for pets and playfellows, Nellie liked to be with the horses, and was constantly alarming her grandmother as she flashed by the windows or down the lanes, mounted upon some half-broken colt. The children loved old Nelson, Washington's war horse. They used to climb upon the fence to pat his forehead as he came racing up to greet his master. There were many other animals, gifts to Washington of friends and admirers. Among them were Spanish jackasses, Chinese pigs, and Chinese geese. There was always something going on to interest the children. They might run down to the river landing to see what strange fish Daddy Jack had caught day in and day out. Daddy Jack was always fishing there in his canoe. Or they might go to meet the hunter, carrying his gun and pouch, his body wrapped with strings of game, his dogs at heel. They liked to look at the game and smooth the thick feathers or soft fur. There were birds, squirrels, wild turkeys, molly cottontails, wily possums, and canvas-back ducks. Coaches of company, too, were coming and going. State dinners were cooked and served to nobles and dignitaries. And when the children ran about the gardens, they saw rare things growing. Fig trees, raisins, limes, oranges, large English mulberries, artichokes. And then there were the mills to visit. The smithy, the shops, the fields, and the negro quarters, all in company with their dear adopted father, Washington himself. But the children, and indeed everyone, looked forward to the evening, when Washington sat with them. This was the children's hour, when by the uncertain twinkle of the homemade candles they danced and sang their little songs. The curled darling of the house was Master Washington, George Washington Park Custis. Many years later, when Lafayette visited Master Washington, then grown up, he told how he had first seen him on the portico of Mount Vernon, a little boy, a very little gentleman, with a feather in his hat, holding fast to one finger of Washington's hand, which finger was so large that the little boy could hardly hold on to it. As for Nellie, she wanted to romp and play from morning till night. 
She did not like to have her hair dressed with feathers and ribbons. She did not enjoy her books and music, and she used to cry for hours together while her determined grandmother stood guard over her, keeping her at practice on the beautiful harpsichord which Washington had given her. As for Washington, he tried to lighten little Nellie's tasks, and used to carry her off for a gallop or a brisk outdoor walk. He was always extremely fond of little girls. He liked other little girls besides Nellie. He had with him her pretty sister, Elizabeth, when he sat for one of his portraits. And in the most critical week of his presidency, Washington went to the house of one of his cabinet officers and played with his little daughters. Harriet Taylor Upton, Retold Many of the stories in this book are from the life of Washington by his adopted son, George Washington Park Custis. Seeing the President Sometimes, when President Washington went on a journey in his state coach, he wanted to travel quietly, without attracting people's attention. So he charged his courier, who rode on ahead, to make all necessary arrangements at inns, but to tell no one but the landlords that the President was coming. Often, however, the news leaked out, and was flashed throughout the countryside. Trumpets were blown as the veterans of the War for Independence gathered to welcome their chief. Village cannon roared. Every village and hamlet poured out its folk to greet the man who was first in the hearts of his countrymen. As for the school children, how eagerly they hurried to get their lessons, so that as a reward they might see General Washington. And when at last he did come, how happy the children were to be presented to him. With delight they listened to his kind voice, felt the kindlier touch of his hand, and even climbed on his knee to look up into his smiling face. George Washington Park Custis, Retold Nelson, the Hero There was one old horse at Mount Vernon, after the War for Independence, who was a hero. He was never ridden. He was cared for kindly. He grazed in a pleasant paddock. That was Nelson, Washington's favorite and splendid charger, which he had ridden on the day of the surrender at Yorktown. He was a light sorrel with white face and legs. Now that he was old, he was petted and cared for. Whenever Washington made the rounds of his kennels and stables, he stopped at the paddock. Then the old war horse would run neighing up to the fence, proud to be caressed by the hand of his master. George Washington Park Custis, retold. Caring for the Guest, told by the guest himself. I had feasted my imagination for several days on the near prospect of a visit to Mount Vernon, the seat of Washington. No pilgrim ever approached Mecca with deeper enthusiasm. The first evening I spent under the wing of his hospitality, we sat a full hour at table, by ourselves, without the least interruption after the family had retired. I was extremely oppressed with a severe cold and excessive coughing, contracted from the exposure of a harsh winter journey. He pressed me to use some remedies, but I declined doing so. As usual, soon after retiring, my cough increased. When some time had elapsed, the door of my room was gently opened, and on drawing back my bed curtains, to my utter astonishment, I beheld Washington himself standing at my bedside with a bowl of hot tea in his hand. Elkanah Watson, Condensed Thoughtful of Others Once, when Washington was stopping for refreshment at a house in Jersey, someone told him that a wounded officer was there, who could not bear the slightest sound. During the meal, Washington spoke in an undertone, and was careful to make no noise. After he had left the table, however, his officers began to talk in loud voices. Instantly, Washington softly opened the dining-room door, entered on tiptoe, took a book from the mantelpiece, and stole out of the room without uttering a word. His officers took the hint, and were silent. The Cincinnatus of the West A man who'd fought to free the land from woe, like me, had left his farm, a soldiering to go, but having gained his point, he had, like me, returned his own potato ground to see. But there he couldn't rest, with one accord. He's called to be a kind of, not a lord, I don't know what. He's not a great man, sure, for poor men love him, just as he was poor. They love him like a father, or a brother. This little verse is from Darby's Return, a play that President Washington went to see. The moment he entered the theater, the whole audience rose to its feet and cheered. And when Darby said these lines, the audience stared hard at Washington to see how he would take them. He looked horribly embarrassed. 
but when Darby quickly added that he had not seen the man at all, at all because he was so plainly dressed that he passed by unnoticed, Washington burst into a hearty laugh. In the ancient days of Rome, a terrible enemy threatened the city. There was no Roman general wise enough to lead the army against the foe. There was just one plain Roman citizen whom the people trusted. They believed that he had the wisdom to save them. This was Cincinnatus the curly-haired. They sent hasty messengers to bid him come to the aid of Rome. The messengers found him tilling his land, for he was a farmer. His feet were heavy with damp earth and his clothes covered with soil. He listened to their message, and to the request of the Roman Senate that he should come at once to the aid of his country. He called his wife to bring his toga from their hut. After he'd wiped off the dust and sweat, he put on his toga and went with the messengers. So he saved Rome. Thus it was with Washington. When the call came for him to save his country, he left his plantation. So did many farmers and planters. At a moment's notice they left their farms and plantations, took up their muskets, and answered the call of their country. They became officers in Washington's army. After the war, these officers formed a society called the Society of the Cincinnati, naming it after the patriotic old Roman farmer. To it belonged Washington, Hamilton, Lafayette, Kosciuszko, and many other American and foreign officers who had served with honor in the Continental Army. Today their descendants, one representing each officer, belong to the Society of the Cincinnati. The French members presented Washington with a magnificent badge of the order, studded with about two hundred precious stones, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and amethysts. Washington himself is called, yes, one, the first, the last, the best, the Cincinnatus of the West. Brother Jonathan, I do hereby earnestly recommend it to all to meet together for social prayer to Almighty God, that he would preserve our precious rights and liberties, and make us a people of his praise, and blessed of the Lord as long as the sun and moon shall endure. Jonathan Trumbull, to the people of Connecticut, June eighteenth, 1776. Patriotic and plucky was Connecticut, the state of the Charter Oak. It had been a liberty-loving colony from the days when its first settlers, with their wives, children, household goods, and cattle, came through the howling wilderness, literally howling with savage Pequot Indians, and settled on the banks of the beautiful Connecticut River, whose name in the Indian language means Long River. Those brave settlers came into the wilderness so that they might have religious and civil liberty. Almost their first act was to frame in 1639 a constitution for their own government. It was the first constitution in America to make no mention of allegiance to King or Great Britain. It breathed the free spirit of American independence over a hundred years before the Declaration of Independence. Is it strange, then, that Jonathan Trumbull, governor of Connecticut under King George, should have been a patriot? He was more than loyal to American freedom. He was Washington's friend and supporter. He supplied Washington with soldiers and ammunition. He supplied more than half the powder used at Bunker Hill. There is a tale that once when Washington was hard put to it for ammunition, and it looked as though the campaign would fail for lack of powder and shot, Washington said to his officers, We must consult Brother Jonathan. Then Washington consulted Governor Trumbull and got his powder and shot. After that, whenever a difficulty arose in the army, the men would say, We must consult Brother Jonathan. So the saying became a byword. Later, people nicknamed the United States Brother Jonathan, just as England is called John Bull. The Bloody Footprints It was the terrible winter of 1777. The snow lay thick on the ground, and the cold was piercing. Through the snow, a detachment of Patriot troops was wearily plodding toward winter quarters at Valley Forge. Half-naked, hungry, and numb with cold, they pushed on. Presently, Washington rode slowly up after them. He was eyeing the snow intently through which they had marched. There was something on its frozen surface, something red, that he had tracked for many miles. Saluting the commanding officer, Washington drew rein. "'How comes it, sir,' he said, "'that I have tracked the march of your troops by the bloodstains of their feet upon the frozen ground?' Were there no shoes in the commissary's stores that this sad spectacle is to be seen along the public highways? Your Excellency may rest assured, replied the officer, 
that this sight is as painful to my feelings as it can be to yours. But there is no remedy within our reach. When the shoes were issued, the different regiments were served in turn. It was our misfortune to be among the last to be served, and the stores became exhausted before we could obtain even the smallest supply. Washington's lips compressed, while his chest heaved with the powerful emotions that were struggling in his bosom, then turning toward the troops with a trembling voice he exclaimed, Poor fellows! Then giving his horse the rein, he rode sadly on. During this touching interview, every eye had been bent upon him, and those two words warm from the heart of their beloved commander, and full of commiseration for their sufferings, reached the soldiers. There burst gratefully from their lips. God bless your excellency, your poor soldier's friend. George Washington Park Custis, Arranged An Appeal to God On a cold, wintry journey to Valley Forge, Mrs. Washington rode behind her husband on a pillion. He was on his powerful bay charger and accompanied by a single aide-de-camp. On his arrival at Valley Forge, Washington placed her in the small but comfortable house of Isaac Potts, a Quaker preacher. So in all the trials of that winter at Valley Forge, Washington had the most earnest sympathies, cheerful spirit, and willing hands of his loving wife to sustain him and share in his cares. She provided comforts for the sick soldiers. Every day except Sundays, the wives of officers and other women, too, assisted her in knitting socks, patching garments, and making shirts for the poor soldiers. Every fair day she might be seen, basket in hand and with single attendant, going among the huts and giving comfort to the most needy sufferers. On one occasion she went to the hut of a dying sergeant, whose young wife was with him. His misery touched the heart of Mrs. Washington, and after she had given him some food prepared with her own hands, she knelt down by his straw bed and prayed earnestly for him and his wife, in her sweet, serious voice. But it was not only women who prayed in those terrible days at Valley Forge. The cold and suffering increased. One day, friend Potts was walking by the creek not far from his house when he heard a solemn voice speaking. He went quietly in its direction and saw Washington's horse without a rider tied to a sapling. He stole nearer and saw Washington himself kneeling in a thicket. He was on his knees in prayer to God, asking him for help. Tears were on Washington's cheeks, and quietly the friend stole away. On entering his house, he burst out weeping. When his wife asked him what was the matter, he said, if there is any one on this earth whom the Lord will listen to, it is George Washington, and I feel a presentiment that under such a commander there can be no doubt of our eventually establishing our independence, and that God in his providence has willed it so. Benson J. Lossing, Arranged End of Chapter 12 Read by Sarah Jump Chapter 13 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. February 22nd, George Washington, the Father of His Country, Part 2 Friend Green At Utah Springs the valiant died. Their limbs with dust are cover o'er. Weep on, ye springs, your tearful tide. How many heroes are no more? Led by thy conquering genius, Green, the Britons they compelled to fly. None distant viewed the fatal plain, none grieved in such a cause to die. From Uata Springs by Philip Franau. It was at the siege of Boston. The troops of the colonies were raw and uncouth. They were camping separately. Washington was inspecting their camps for the first time. He saw that their shelters were made of anything the soldiers could lay hands on. Turf, bricks, sailcloth, boards, or brushwood. Each soldier seemed to
to live and do as he pleased but when washington reached the camp of the rhode island troops he perceived neat tents pitched soldiers well drilled and equipped and under perfect discipline he was pausing to look around him with pleasure and approval when a young officer vigorous and finely built stepped forward to greet him his frank manly face beaming with a cordial welcome the young man was nathaniel green commander of the rhode island troops it was he who had trained them after studying the maneuvers of the british troops in boston nathaniel green was born a friend or quaker when a boy he worked in his father's forge and helped on the farm he was an eager to read he got together a little library of his own he studied hard he liked best to read about military heroes when he grew older although he was a friend he joined the rhode island militia later he was appointed rhode island's commander and led her troops to bunker hill and the siege of boston washington liked and trusted him at first sight later his confidence became friendship at valley forge nathaniel green gave up active duty in the field much to his sorrow and regret and became quartermaster general he gave up his ambitions in order to help washington relieve the sufferings of the troops as quartermaster general he was soon able to supply them with some blankets clothes and food all of which congress had failed to deliver later green's reward of faithful service came washington appointed him commander of the army in the south it was a post of great danger but he conducted his military operations with such courage and sagacity that they led on to completed victory for the american arms at yorktown this is what john fisk says of nathaniel green the intellectual qualities which he showed in his southern campaign were those which have characterized some of the foremost strategists of modern times nor was green less notable for the sweetness and purity of his character than for the scope of his intelligence from lowly beginnings he had come to be the most admired and respected citizen of rhode island light horse harry the american congress to henry lee colonel of cavalry notwithstanding rivers and entrenchments he with a small band aired the foe by warlike skill and prowess and firmly bound by his humanity those who had been conquered by his arms in memory of the conflict at paulus's hook nineteenth of august seventeen seventy nine one the most dashing and romantic young soldier of the continental army was light horse harry his real name was henry lee he was a small alert young man mischievous sometimes but always brave he was a cavalry leader he commanded the famous legion of light horse which took part in so many heroic battles he was one of washington's most trusted generals his charm and dauntlessness delighted washington who showed warm interest in his promotion perhaps this was because light horse harry's mother had been washington's young sweetheart in his schoolboy days my lowland beauty he had called her but she had married a lee and not washington light horse harry had many adventures as romantic and daring as himself two light horse harry was a favorite at mount vernon he did not stand in any reverential awe of the great washington one day as they sat at table washington mentioned that he wanted a pair of carriage horses and asked the young man if he knew where they might be bought i have a fine pair general replied he but you cannot get them 
why not because you will never pay more than half price for anything and i must have full price for my horses this bantering reply set mrs washington laughing and her parrot perched beside her joined in the laugh washington took this familiar assault upon his dignity with great good humor ah lee you are a funny fellow said he see that bird is laughing at you three when washington died it was light horse harry who was chosen by congress to deliver the funeral oration before both houses it was in this oration that he said those famous words he survives in our hearts in the growing knowledge of our children in the affection of the good throughout the world first in war first in peace and first in the hearts of his countrymen pious just humane temperate and sincere uniform dignified and commanding the purity of his private character gave effluence to his public virtues washington irving and other sources retold captain molly proudly floats the starry banner monmouth's glorious field is won and in triumph irish molly stands beside her smoking gun moll pitcher twenty-two years old was dubbed captain at the battle of monmouth and very proud she was of the title her real name was molly hayes she carried drinking water on the battlefield to refresh the soldiers so they nicknamed her ma pitcher at monmouth her husband a patriot belonged to proctor's artillery ma was with him on the field six men one after another were killed or wounded at her husband's gun it's an unlucky gun grumbled the soldiers draw it aside and abandon it just at that moment while moll was serving water to the soldiers her husband received a shot in the head and fell lifeless under the wheels of that very gun moll threw down her pail of water and crying lie there my darling while i revenge ye she grasped the ramrod that the lifeless hand of the poor fellow had let fall and rammed home the charge then she called to the artillerymen to prime and fire it was done pushing the sponge into the smoking muzzle of the gun she performed the duties of an expert artilleryman while loud shots from the soldiers passed along the line the gun was no longer thought unlucky the fire of the battery became more vivid than ever moll kept her post till night closed the action and the british were driven back by the patriots washington himself leading them to the attack it was then that general green complimented moll on her courage and conduct the next morning he presented her to washington who received her graciously and gave her a piece of gold assuring her that her services should not be forgotten washington conferred upon her the commission of sergeant and placed her name on the half-pay list for life the french officers charmed with her bravery gave her many presents she would sometimes pass along the french line with her cocked hat and get it almost filled with crowns she was always welcome at headquarters she wore a cocked hat and feather and an artilleryman's coat over her petticoat one day washington found her washing clothes and stopped to chat with her well captain molly he said are you not almost tired of this quiet way of life and longing to be once more on the field of battle truth your excellency she replied and ye may say that for i care not how soon i have another slap at them redcoats 
bad luck to them but what is to become of your petticoats in such an event captain molly oh long life to your excellency she said and never do ye mind them at all at all sure and it is only in the artillery your excellency knows that i would sarve and divil a fear but the smoke of the cannon will hide my petticoats george washington park kirstis and other sources the soldier baron the good baron found time to prepare a new code of discipline and tactics and this excellent manual held its place long after the death of its author as the blue book of our army john fisk while the ragged patriot army with washington starved froze and suffered at valley forge there was speeding down from boston on a fast saddle horse a man who was to help them win the war his keen hazel eyes looked pleasantly out from under bushy brows his mouth smiled with good cheer but he held his head in military fashion the glittering star of a foreign order was on his breast and he carried a letter of recommendation from benjamin franklin to george washington commander-in-chief of the american army he was baron steuben a famous soldier and german hero of the seven years war he had offered his services to washington to train the army explaining that he wished to deserve the title of a citizen of america by fighting for her liberty at his side rode his young and waggish french interpreter in scarlet regimentals faced with blue his bright eyes were always on the watch for a glimpse of pretty american maidens behind the two came their servants with the baggage it began to snow heavily night fell they drew rain at an inn it had a bad name and it was kept by a tory i've no beds bread meat drink milk or eggs for you said the tollen tory landlord and neither steuben's remonstrances or oaths could make him change his mind steuben's blood began to boil bring me my pistol he cried in german to his servant and the landlord who was smiling maliciously suddenly felt a pistol pressed against his breast can you give us beds shouted steuben yes cried the affrighted man bread yes meat drink milk eggs yes 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 and the trembling landlord scurried around the table was quickly laid and food set out then after a substantial supper a comfortable night and a hearty breakfast the baron and his men mounted and were off again to cut the story short he was soon at valley forge serving with washington and training the troops they had little expert military training before the baron drilled the soldiers himself he took a musket in hand and showed them how to advance retreat or charge without falling into disorder not only the soldiers but the generals colonels and captains watched him eagerly and with enthusiasm soon the camp was a bustling military training school the men almost forgot their sufferings so intent they were on learning they worked incessantly and with tremendous energy but the baron made it lively for them for he had a quick temper he swore at them in three languages and when they did not understand that he called his aide to help him out in english some of the men had thrown away their bayonets and some had used them for roasting meat but the baron soon drilled them to use bayonets with such good effect that when later a column of them stormed stony point 
they took it in a bayonet charge he the bluff steuben never failed in bravery on the battlefield at monmouth while the american troops were fleeing in panic the baron kept doggedly on with his face to the foe meanwhile washington furious and fiery rallied the soldiers and led them back to victory it was now says john fisk that the admirable results of steuben's teaching were to be seen the retreating soldiers immediately wheeled and formed under fire with as much coolness and precision as they could have shown on parade bluff generous kindly old steuben still served the country after peace and independence came then he settled down on his farm of sixteen thousand acres the gift to him from the state of new york in recognition of his patriotic services throughout the war says john fisk steuben proved no less faithful than capable he came to feel a genuine love for his adopted country father thaddeus hope for a season bade the world farewell and freedom shrieked as cosico fell thomas cadwell what do you wish to do said washington the young polish officer with a rugged face held himself erect i come answered he to fight as a volunteer for american independence what can you do asked washington try me said the young pole his dark eyes flashing pleasantly so washington tried him he was thaddeus kosikuso born in lithuania and a patriot of unhappy poland poor poland dismembered patriotic poland again and again she had been betrayed and divided by her greedy neighbors russia prussia and austria but always the fires of patriotism had burned in the hearts of the poles and though they had been forced to bow their necks to their enemies they had never bowed their hearts and it was a romantic story that had sent young Cosico post haste from poland to america he was poor but of good blood he had fallen in love with a beautiful and clever polish girl her father was a haughty rich state official he would not give his consent to their marriage so the young lovers eloped the father pursued them with his men Cosico fought like a lion to defend his beloved Ludwika, but her father's men wounded him so severely that he fell senseless on the field. Then her father carried Ludwika home and married her to another man. When Cosico came to his senses, his love was gone. Her handkerchief stained with his own blood lay beside him he took it up reverently and placed it in his bosom thus disappointed in love he had left poland and come to america to forget his grief in fighting for freedom for cosico he had been a patriot and a lover of liberty for all men since his early boyhood washington placed him on his own staff soon he found that the young man had talent and was an experienced army engineer he commissioned him chief engineer cosico rendered great service to america but his most important work was on the defenses of west point when our war for independence was over he returned to poland he became her leading patriot defending her against the invasions of russia prussia and austria father thaddeus his men called him as he led them into battle during his famous defense of warsaw he was badly wounded on the battlefield and captured by cossacks he was thrown into a russian prison and there he was kept until after the death of catherine the great 
he was released by the new Tsar, who admired him and wished to give him a brilliant commission in the Russian army. But Kosciuszko refused his offer and went into voluntary exile. He still hoped that some day he might serve Poland. His wounds were yet unhealed. There was a saber cut across his forehead. There were three bayonet thrusts in his back. A part of his thigh had been torn away by a cannonball. Around his forehead he kept black band tied over the saber cut. He went into exile, and the people of Poland believed that he was dead. It was nearly seventy-five years after that red-letter day in Lithuania on which Thaddeus Kosciuszko had been born. It was in 1814. France and Russia were at war. The Russian army, as it advanced against Paris, was barbarously pillaging the valley of the Seine. The soldiers were burning the cottages of the poor peasants over their heads, and ill-treating the children, women, and aged folk. Among the Russian troops was a Polish regiment, and while its soldiers were savagely burning and looting the little houses, an old man with a scar across his forehead rushed suddenly in among them. Raging like a lion, he shouted in Polish, When I commanded brave soldiers, they never pillaged. I should have punished them severely. And still more severely would I have punished officers who allowed such disorders as you are all now engaged in. And who are you, my pretty old man? cried the officers with sneers and laughter. Who are you that you dare to speak to us in such a tone and with such boldness? I am Cossico, was the quick reply. Each man stood fixed to the spot. Each was paralyzed with astonishment. There, before them, with flashing eyes, stood Poland's hero, the Polish soldier's father Thaddeus. Then the men threw down their arms to the ground. They cast themselves at his feet. They sprinkled dust upon their heads, as was their wild custom at home. They crept close to him, hugging his knees and begging for his forgiveness for the forgiveness of their father Thaddeus. When Kosciuszko died in Switzerland in 1817, there was found in his bosom, next to his heart, the blood-stained handkerchief which his lost love Ludwika had dropped beside him so long before. Today, in a little chapel at the foot of the lime-planted hill, the Linderhof, there is a bronze urn in which lies the once brave heart of Thaddeus Kosciuszko. The Little Friend in Front Street He entitled himself to the gratitude of the entire country. Ex-President William H. Taft He was only a little man in his office on Front Street, Philadelphia. Only a little man, but how great! Without his help, our war for independence might have been lost. He helped to save the country not with a sword, but by giving all the means that he had and expecting nothing in return. This little man, his little friend in Front Street, as James Madison called him, was Haim Salomon, a Polish Jew and a patriot. Though Robert Morris who was superintendent of finance during the war for independence, Haim Salomon loaned money to establish the government and to pay the soldiers. Without his money, Washington could scarcely have held the army together, and all the while the little friend in Front Street was refusing any interest on his loans, and some of these loans were never repaid at all and not only financed the nation, but generously made personal advances of money without interest to members of the government in order that they may keep on in their patriotic work. 
when any member was in need all that was necessary was to call upon solomon said james madison but it was not only by financing our young nation that Haim solomon showed his patriotism he was born in poland of an intelligent educated family he knew many languages he was a friend of kosciuszko and polanski because of oppression he left poland and came to new york city he married and settled down to business he soon found however that the americans were heavily oppressed by england so he threw himself heart and soul into the cause for independence he became a patriot he was arrested by the british imprisoned tortured and condemned to death he managed to escape and reached philadelphia safely there he opened his broker's office in front street he became a great financier henceforth he unselfishly devoted his brains his energy and his wealth to help win the war for independence and build up our republic farewell my general farewell december fourth seventeen eighty three the war for independence was over thursday the fourth of december was fixed upon for the final leave-taking of washington with his officers this was the most trying event in his whole career and he summoned all his self-command to meet it with composure knox and green and hamilton and steuben and others assembled in francis tavern and waited with fast-beating hearts the arrival of their chief not a sound broke the silence as he entered save the clatter of scabbards as the whole group rose to do him reverence casting his eye around he saw the sad and mournful countenances of those who had been his companion in arms through the long years of darkness that had passed shoulder to shoulder they had pressed by his side through the smoke of the conflict he had heard their battle shout answer his call in the hour of deepest peril and seen them bear his standard triumphantly on to victory brave hearts were they all and true on whom he had leaned and not in vain advancing slowly to the table washington lifted the glass to his lips and said in a voice choked with emotion with a heart full of gratitude and love i now take leave of you i most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable a mournful profound silence followed this short address when knox advanced to say farewell but neither could utter a word knox reached forth his hand while washington opening his arms took him to his heart in silence that was more eloquent than all language each advanced in turn and was clasped in his embrace washington dared not trust himself to speak and looking a silent farewell turned to the door a corps of light infantry was drawn up on either side to receive him and as he passed slowly through the lines a gigantic soldier who had moved beside him in the terrible march on trenton stepped from the ranks and reaching out his arms exclaimed farewell my dear general farewell washington seized his hand in both of his and wrung it convulsively in a moment all discipline was at an end and the soldiers broke their order and rushing around him seized him by the hands covering them with tears this was too much for even his strong nature and as he moved away the, his broad chest heaved and tears rolled unchecked down his face passing the white hall he entered a barge and as it moved out into the bay he rose and waved a mute adieu to the noble band on shore the impressive scene was over j t headley condensed from washington's legacy 
or his letter to the governors of all the states i now make it my earnest prayer that god would have you and the state over which you preside his holy protection that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another for their fellow citizens of the united states at large and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field and finally that he would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice to love mercy and to demean ourselves with that charity humility and pacific temper of mind which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion and without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation george washington eighth of june seventeen eighty three a king of men hand in hand with rare soundness of judgment there went a completeness of moral self-control which was all the more impressive inasmuch as washington was by no means a tame or commonplace nature such as ordinary power of will would suffice to guide he was a man of intense and fiery passions his anger when once aroused had in it something so terrible that strong men were cowed by it like frightened children this prodigious animal nature was habitually curbed by a will of iron and held in the service of a sweet and tender soul into which no mean or unworthy thought had ever entered whole-souled devotion to public duty an incorruptible integrity which no appeal to ambition or vanity could for a moment solicit these were attributes of washington as well marked as his clearness of mind and his strength of purpose and it was in no unworthy temple that nature had enshrined this great spirit his lofty stature exceeding six feet his grave and handsome face his noble bearing and courtly grace of manner all proclaimed in washington a king of men john fisk when washington died crape enshrouded the standards of france and the flags upon the victorious ships of england fell fluttering to half mask at the tidings of his death chief justice fuller let his countrymen consecrate the memory of the heroic general the patriotic statesman and the virtuous sage let them teach their children never to forget that the fruits of his labors and his example are their inheritance the senate of the united states seventeen ninety nine the following stories about washington and the war for independence may be found in good stories for great holidays three old tales the cherry tree tale young george and the colt washington the athlete washington's modesty washington at yorktown washington and the cowards betsy ross and the flag a brave girl general schuler's daughter a gunpowder story elizabeth zane the declaration of independence signing of the declaration of independence end of chapter 13 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc